Thank you for joining today's acquisition seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled Equal Employment Opportunity Responsibilities of Federal Procurement Officers, an update, presents a look at the recent changes to the Equal Employment Opportunity Requirements established by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs in the U.S. Department of Labor. As an acquisition professional, there are so many details you need to give your attention to in a procurement action. Methods of acquisition, past performance, the excluded parties list, the drug-free workplace requirements, compliance with green contracting provisions, and so on. It can be absolutely overwhelming. Not to be forgotten are vendor equal opportunity requirements. OFCCP will provide information on updates to the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the recently issued Executive Order 13672, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. In addition, our presenters will discuss the impact of these changes on federal government contracts and the Equal Opportunity Clause, the pre-award clearance process, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the contractor's filing of the EEO-1 report, and the Equal Employment Opportunity is the Law poster. Before we begin, let me remind you that we will hold a live question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. If you have a question about anything you may hear from our presenters, we encourage you to submit it at any time using the survey link to the right of the video screen. We will collect and review your questions during the presentation, take a short break, and then return to answer as many as we can. Also, we would love to get your suggestions on future acquisition seminar topics. So let's join Brenda Williams Stewart of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, Department of Labor, who will be our guide to EEO responsibilities of federal procurement officers. Welcome everyone. My name is Brenda Williams Stewart and I'm with the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, better known as OFCCT. I'm your moderator for today's presentation on the responsibilities of federal procurement officers. I want to thank FAI for working with OFCCP in this joint effort to provide you with important information. I have with me today several OFCCP officials who are going to review with you the Equal Employment Opportunity requirements associated with federal contracting and the related obligations of procurement and contracting officers. During today's presentation, we'll also update you on recent changes to our program. We welcome your questions throughout the presentation, so please send them in and we'll address the answers at the end of our presentation. To begin our presentation, I take great pleasure in introducing you to Deborah Carr, who serves as the Director of the Division of Policy and Program Development for OFCCP at the U.S. Department of Labor in Washington, D.C. She leads policy's two branches, Branch of Regulatory, Legislative, and Policy Development, and the Branch of Training, Education, and Program Development. Ms. Carr joined OFCCP after serving as Associate Deputy Staff Director for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, also known as USCCR, and before that as its General Counsel. While at USCCR, Ms. Carr wrote several vital reports with important policy ramifications, including an evaluation of the Native American health care system and the need to reauthorize the Indian Health Care Improvement Act an assessment of the effectiveness of the No Child Left Behind Act, and a review of the usefulness of Executive Order 12898 and Title VII as tools for achieving environmental justice. Before joining USCCR, Ms. Carr distinguished herself as a civil rights lawyer at the Department of Justice by handling some of this country's most difficult and heinous violations of federal criminal civil rights statutes. Ms. Carr headed a White House office and represented the U.S. at the United Nations on issues related to racism and xenophobia. She also participated in the preparation of the government's report to the U.N. Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I'll now turn the presentation over to Deborah Carr for opening remarks. Hi, I'm Deborah Carr the Director of Policy for the Department of Labor's 
Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. I want to extend my thanks to FEI for inviting me and my colleagues to represent our director, Pat Shu during this training event. As some of you know, the Department of Labor has been actively involved in new rulemaking over the last four years. Some of those new regulations will have direct impact on how federal contracting officers conduct their day-to-day -day business. The value of having OFCCP participate in this training opportunity is that we hope to inform you of your new obligations created by these recent rulemakings. For example, we have recently updated regulations governing the employment of people with disabilities, the recruitment and employment of veterans, especially disabled veterans, and we recently completed a final rule protecting the employment rights of LGBT individuals, as we uh, call it at the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. We currently have pending an update to regulations governing sex discrimination as well. As you will hear during the course of this presentation, many of these new rules require contractors to incorporate into their subcontracts specific language governing equal opportunity. In addition, contracting officers with federal agencies will also be required to include specific language in their prime contracts with companies doing business with the federal government. We at OFCCP hope that you will find the information that you will hear throughout this training opportunity useful. What we found as we did rulemaking over the last four years is that at least two of our new regulations have the potential to increase the employment opportunities of more than 600,000 individuals. We can only get to that number by working in partnership with you. So please, listen to the information and find a way that we can work together to ensure that all qualified Americans have equal opportunity to significant employment opportunities and that we can achieve the goal of full employment for most qualified Americans. So the expectation is that by working together you can help us achieve our goal of strengthening America's middle class by providing qualified workers a real opportunity at good paying jobs. So please, listen to the important information, enjoy this opportunity, and we look forward to working with you in the future. And with that, I, I turn this over to Brenda who will introduce the next portion of our program. Also joining us today are two OFCCP representatives that bring many years of experience in enforcing civil rights laws and ensuring contract compliance. Melissa Spear is the Regional Director of OFCCP's Southwest and Rocky Mountain Region, also known as SWARM. She provides leadership for more than 91 employees spanning 11 states and seven offices. She's been making workplaces fair since she came to OFCCP in 1989. She began her career as a compliance officer in our Little Rock area office and has worked throughout the Swarm region as a liaison officer, district director in Dallas, director of regional operations, and deputy regional director. Ms. Spear received a Bachelor's of Science in Accounting from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock in 1988 as well as a Master's of Business Administration in 1991. In addition, we also have Herman Nacho, who is OFCCP's Branch Chief for Enforcement. He's located in the National Office and began his career with OFCCP in February of 2014. Prior to his move to OFCCP, Herman had over 20 years of experience at DOL's Office of the Solicitor where he provided legal advice on procurement, appropriation, and intellectual property issues 
as well as litigated bid protests and contract claim cases. During his tenure at SOL, Herman also provided legal advice to SOL's Mind Safety and Health Division, drafting and reviewing safety regulations for the Mind Safety and Health Administration and providing legal advice to all areas of DOL's Employment and Training Administration. He has managed legislative and departmental communications between DOL, Congress, and OMB. He was a law clerk to Judge Robert H. Hodges of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims and is a graduate of Georgetown Law, Georgetown law School and Dartmouth College. Welcome, Melissa and Herman. Melissa, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Brenda, and I want to thank FAI for giving us the opportunity to speak with a very important segment of our stakeholders, federal procurement and contracting officers. During today's presentation, we would like to introduce you to the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP, what we as a federal agency do, the laws we enforce, and how we enforce them. We will also discuss which contractors are covered. We will discuss how the regulations we enforce interact with the FAR, the rules that regulate your work, the general responsibilities of contracting officers during the pre- and post-award time of a contract. We will also provide an overview of the pre-award process, which is one of the most important responsibilities of procurement officers. Throughout the presentation, we will incorporate recent changes to the laws enforced by OFCCP and how it impacts or relates to your responsibility as a procurement officer. OFCCP is an agency within the U.S. Department of Labor that enforces laws prohibiting employment discrimination of federal contractors and subcontractors. Federal contractors and subcontractors are those employers that are doing business with the federal government. This includes all types of businesses, construction, manufacturers, banks, leasing companies, and so on. The laws enforced by OFCCP prohibit covered federal contractors from discriminating in employment on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, disability, or the status as a protected vet, and requires those contractors to engage in affirmative action. OFCCP is made up of a national office in Washington, D.C., six regional offices nationwide, and 49 district and area offices in major metropolitan areas throughout the United States, including Puerto Rico and Guam. As a federal procurement officer, your primary point of contact will be with our regional offices located in Dallas, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, and Atlanta. Generally speaking, procurement officers will contact the regional offices through the pre-award monitor. We will discuss that process later in the presentation. OFCCP enforces civil rights laws that protect applicants and employees of federal contractors, subcontractors, and federally assisted construction contractors and subcontractors. These laws are Executive Order 11246, which prohibits the discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, and national origin. Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability, and the Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, or VEVRA, prohibits discrimination on the basis of a status as a protected veteran. I want to take a moment to highlight some of the recent changes in each of these laws. Recently, the executive order was amended to include the prohibition against employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. This amendment to the executive order goes into effect on April 8th of 2015 and applies to covered federal contracts and subcontracts that are entered into or modified on after April 8th, 2015. In terms of what contracting officers need to do, the executive order equal opportunity clause was amended to include sexual orientation and gender identity. When we discuss the equal opportunity or EO clauses, we will highlight where it is inserted. 
In addition, OFCCP has published two notice of proposed rulemaking. The first will prohibit covered contractors from disciplining employees for discussing and disclosing their pay, and the second will require covered contractors to provide an annual report on compensation paid to employees. The prohibition pay secrecy policies also impact the EEO clause by adding a new paragraph to the clause. When the rules are finalized, the EEO clause will be revised in covered contracts issued on or after the effective date of those rules. Another significant change we made was in March of last year. We published two new regulations implementing the requirements of Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act and FEVRA. This was the first major change for both of these rules since 1970. The changes were made to update the regulations to reflect current practices and legal standards as well to ensure more proactive approach to ensuring individuals with disabilities and protected veterans have an equal opportunity in employment with federal contractors and subcontractors. Contractors are now in the process of coming into compliance with the new requirements that include self-identification of applicants and employees, goals and hiring benchmarks, and data collection. If these questions come to you as a procurement officer, we request that you refer the contractors to either our website or our help desk so we can provide them with the information they need to comply. The laws that OFCCP enforce can be found at the Code of Federal Regulations at Title 41, Chapter 60. The requirements related to procurement officers are incorporated into the FAR. So which contractors are actually covered? There are specific thresholds associated with OFCCP's jurisdiction. For the executive order, it is a contract is covered if it's in excess of $10,000. In addition, non-construction or supply and service contractors with a contract of $50,000 or more and who have 50 or more employees must also develop and maintain a written affirmative action programs. Contractors must comply with specific affirmative action requirements, including outreach and recruitment efforts, self-monitoring of their employment practices, the identification and correction of discriminatory practices, and the identification and removal of any barriers to equal employment opportunity. The Rehabilitation Act applies to contracts or subcontracts in excess of $15,000. You may be familiar with the previous threshold of $10,000. This threshold is affected by an adjustment inflation rate and was raised to the $15,000. In addition, contractors with contracts of $50,000 or more and who have 50 or more employees must also develop and maintain written affirmative action programs. Unlike the executive order, this requirement for written affirmative action programs applies to both non-construction and construction contractors. VEVRA applies to contractors of $100,000 or more. Contractors with 50 or more employees are required to develop and maintain a written affirmative action programs. Like Section 503, this obligation applies to both construction and non-construction contractors. The protections of VEVRA apply to protected veterans, which are defined as disabled veterans, determined as those who will receive disability compensation from the VA, or would be eligible but not for retire military pay. Recently separated veterans, veterans who served on active duty during a war or campaign when a badge was authorized, and veterans who participated in U.S. military operations that received an Armed Forces Service Medal. To ensure contractors comply with these laws, OFCCP conducts its civil rights enforcement responsibilities in a number of ways. OFCCP conducts compliance evaluations of contractors and subcontractors even where no discrimination complaint has been filed. We take a hard look at the company's employment practices and policies, including policies related to hiring, testing, promotions, compensations, and terminations to ensure that discrimination has not occurred. To do that, we review the contractor's AAP and other records. We may also decide to do an on-site to the contractor's facility and interview managers and employees, among other things. OFCCP investigates complaints of discrimination filed by individuals or groups. It deals exclusively with employers that are federal contractors. Only the laws that OFCCP enforce 
require affirmative action by covered contractors to ensure that all are provided with equal employment opportunity. We work closely with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, to ensure that there is no duplication of efforts by our respective agencies and to ensure that any misfiled complaints are proper, properly redirected to the correct agency. In addition to conducting compliance evaluations and investigating complaints, OFCCP provides free compliance assistance to contractors to assist them in complying with the laws OFCCP enforces, including workshops on different topics such as guidance for new contractors, how to develop an AAP, and a course on any new regulations. OFCCP also educates community-based organizations and members of the public to facilitate an understanding of and compliance with the laws we enforce. This might include events which organizations are invited to attend and to assist in building collaborations between contractors and the organizations serving people with disabilities. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Herman. Thank you. Thank you. As we explained earlier, OSCCP's regulations are codified in the Code of Federal Regulations in Title 41, Chapter 60. In addition, the requirements related to procurement officers are incorporated in the FAR, which is the set of regulations governing all acquisitions and contracting procedures in the federal government. As many of you may be aware, the FAR is designed to provide a common set of regulations and procedures for acquisitions to be used throughout the federal government. It contains an overall structure and broad procedures for the government to use when purchasing goods and services. The Equal Employment Opportunity Requirements derived from Executive Order 11246 are found in the FAR at 22.8. These regulations address the requirements for procurement officers as it relates to incorporating equal employment opportunity into contracts and the contract process. It includes the affirmative action requirements for construction and non-construction or supply and service contractors found at 22.804 and the contract procedures found at FAR 22.805 including pre-award clearances, which we will be discussing. In addition, the FAR includes the Section 503 and VEVRA procedures for contracting officers. These are incorporated into the FAR at subparts 22.13 and 22.14. Subpart 22.13, this section covers a range of definitions and descriptions of veterans and discusses policies and procedures in hiring protected veterans. It also describes affirmative action requirements. Subpart 22.14, this section provides detail on employment of workers with disabilities, including policies and procedures for hiring workers with disabilities. So let's review the responsibilities and requirements. We'll begin by breaking down the steps. Looking at the requirements and the process, we've identified three significant stages with equally significant responsibilities. These are the solicitation or request for proposals, timeframes, pre-award and post-award of the contract. We'll review these stages and the specific actions or obligations of federal procurement and contracting officers in the next several slides. When a contracting officer is putting together the request for proposal or invitation for bids for a contract, certain provisions must be included. The purpose is to give notice to all prospective contractors that the contract is a covered contract and it includes provisions related to equal employment opportunity and affirmative action. The provisions include ensuring that facilities are not segregated, whether or not the prospective contractor has ever been a federal contractor, and whether the contractor has provided required reports, specifically the EE01 report and the annual report of veteran hiring. The provisions also include notification of visa and not. If the contractor is required to perform work in or on behalf of a foreign country. In addition, the notice provides information related to the requirement for affirmative action. For non-construction or supply and service contractors, this involves the assurance that if it meets the specific threshold, it has or will be able to develop and maintain the required written affirmative action program. An additional significant provision is the notice of pre-award on-site evaluation. This notification advises the prospective contractor that it could be the subject of a pre-award compliance evaluation, which could include an on-site during which OCCP would examine employment policies and records and interview employees. 
the purpose of such an evaluation is to assess compliance with the EEO and affirmative action obligation and to provide the contractor technical assistance including information related to the obligations and resources available. For construction contractors, this is the notice of the specific affirmative action provisions required of all federal construction contractors. This notice includes the goals for the geographic area in which the project is located. The affirmative action compliance provision ensures that contractors are aware of the obligations of non-discrimination, the outreach, recruiting, and training, and record keeping obligations, as well as the goals for, for the project. It also includes the notification that when awarded, the contractor is required to notify OCCP of subcontracts in excess of $10,000. So where would you find the goals for construction projects? Construction goals are posted on OSCCP's website. As a reminder, the construction goals are to be incorporated into the contract and subcontract. These are utilization goals that are focused on the construction trades. The goal for women is 6.9% of the hours worked and the goal for minorities varies by geographical area. If you have questions related to the appropriate goal for a particular area, please contact the regional office where the work is being performed. Agencies are required to ensure prospective contractor certified compliance. The prospective contractor will certify whether or not they participated in a previous federal contract or subcontract. In addition, the prospective contractors are required to state at the outset of the negotiations for the contract or at bid opening whether it has, a develop, whether it has developed a written affirmative action program and has such a document on file at each of its establishments. In addition, it must state whether it has filed an EEO-1 report with a joint reporting committee. The attestations and certifications found in the System for Award Management, also known as SAM, will show you if the contractor has certified the development of an AAP had previous contracts and filed an EEO-1 report. To certify submission of the VETS 4212 report, formerly the VETS 100 or VETS 100A, a contracting officer must query the Department of Labor VETS 100 database. So you can see on the screen is the SAM information. When looking at prospective contractors, it's important to review sections FAR 52.222-22 which addresses previous contracts and compliance reports. FAR 52.222-25 addresses affirmative action compliance. In these sections, you will find the certifications and attestations. You will probably recognize the screenshot from the, from the website for the System for Award Management. What resources are available to a contracting officer if a prospective contractor has a question about their obligations? Resources available include OCCP's website where a prospective contractor can find information on the requirements associated with federal contracting and subcontracting, included frequently asked questions, training webinars, information for small and new contractors, and brochures. In addition, the website includes searchable databases of community-based organizations capable of referring qualified individuals with disabilities protected veterans, women, and minorities. OSCCP has a help desk available to the public. Prospective contractors can call or email the help desk for assistance. Additional resources include technical assistance, presentations at OCCP's local district offices. These officers offer seminars or, pers or prospective contractors can request individual help. Contracting officers must ensure that the contractor or subcontractor receiving the award is eligible. In fact, the regulations are specific that no contract or modification involving a new acquisition shall be entered into and no subcontract shall be approved by a contract officer with a person who has been found ineligible by, ineligible by OCCP's director for reasons of non-compliance with the requirements of Executive Order Section 503 and VEVRA. Eligibility can be determined through, through SAM. This list includes businesses that have been debarred from receiving federal monies for not complying with the requirements and obligations associated with federal contracting. 
In addition, contracting officers must make certain that the manner in which the contract is written does not circumvent the requirements of the Executive Order, Section 503, and VEPRA. Prior to awarding a contract of $10 million or more, agencies are required to get EEO clearance from OSCCP. This clearance is now required by all three of the laws OSCCP enforces. The requirement includes contracts for indefinite quantities and modifications of existing contracts for a new effort that would constitute a contract award. Contracting officers are also required to request pre-award clearances for first-tiered subcontractors of $10 million or more. Again, the request for pre-award clearance is required under all three of the laws enforced by OSCCP. Before we discuss the process for requesting pre-award clearances, we'll review the exception. The one exception to the request for a pre-award clearance is if the specific proposed contractor is listed in OSCCP's National Pre-Award Registry found on our website. Melissa? Thank you. Uh, this is a searchable database of contractors that have undergone a compliance evaluation and received a notice of compliance within the last 24-month period. If the prospective contractor is on the list, then you would document the registry review in your contract file. When determining whether or not the prospective contractor is cleared, remember the clearance is for a specific contractor's facility. If the contractor's facility you are looking for is not found on the registry, then you will need to contact the OFCCP pre-award monitor in the regional office where the contract will be performed. If you don't know who to contact, you can call the OFCCP national office. What about option years contracts? If the initial award is less than $10 million, but the award's option year could potentially meet the $10 million threshold, is the pre-award clearance required? Yes. Consider the total value of the contract, including any options to determine the $10 million threshold. Contractors are encouraged to submit pre-award clearances at least 30 days before the proposed award date. The request for EEO pre-award clearances can be sent by email to the regional office where the contract will be performed. The email addresses for each region are listed on our website. In the request, you are required to provide the following information. Name, address, point of contact, and telephone number of the proposed contractor. Name, address, point of contact, and telephone number of each proposed subcontractor with subcontracts estimated at $10 million or more the anticipated date of the award, information regarding whether the contract or subcontractors have previously held any government contracts or subcontracts, the place or places of performance, the estimated dollar amount of the contract and subcontract if known. OFCCP has 15 days after receiving the clearance request to inform the awarding agency of its intent to conduct a pre-award compliance evaluation. If the awarding agency is not informed, it may proceed with the award. If OFCCP states it will perform an evaluation, it is allowed additional 20 days to do so. Which regional office should I send the pre-award clearance request to? The answer to that question is it depends. If the place of performance is known and it is a single place of performance, the pre-award clearance request should be sent to the regional office that covers the place of performance. If there are multiple places of performance crossing regions, the pre-award clearance request should go to the regional office where the contractor's corporate headquarters is located. If you have additional questions about specific pre-award request, we encourage you to follow up with the regional office where you made the request. Once a contractor is selected, Contracting officers are responsible for several significant actions related to EEO and affirmative action. These are incorporating the equal opportunity clauses into the contracts, providing the contractor with access to the appropriate notices for employees, referring inquiries and complaints to OSCCP, and notifying OCCP of construction contract awards. Over the next several slides, we'll review each of these obligations with you. 
Each of OSCCP's laws includes an Equal Opportunity Clause or EO Clause. These clauses can be incorporated individually into covered contracts and subcontracts or combined and incorporated. The clauses are important as it sets forth for the contractor and its subcontractors the requirements and obligations related to federal contracting and subcontracting. The clauses prohibit discrimination, require affirmative action, and requires notice be given to employees, unions, and subcontractors. The clauses also provide OCCP access to the contractor's facility or work site in the case of construction and clearly state that the contractor may not enter into a subcontract with the debarred contractor. As we mentioned previously, the EO clauses were updated by Section 503 and Federal Rules, as well as by recent amendments to the Executive Order 11246. On the slide, on the slide, try again. All right, slide 35. On the slide is an example of a combined EO clause. The revised Section 503 and Federal Regulations require more information specifying that the contractor is an equal opportunity employer of protected veterans and individuals with disabilities. It's a clear message that lets contractors, subcontractors, vendors, and suppliers know that they may now have requirements if they meet OCCP thresholds. In addition, this clause includes the most recent amendment to the executive order, which added sexual orientation and gender identity to the protected basis. This example can be found on OCCP's website. Check the FAQ sections, frequently asked questions. The EO clauses indicate that the contracting officer will provide a contractor with a notice for contractors to post. The notice is the EEO is the law poster. This poster can be found on OFCCP's website or on EEOC's website in a printable format. A supplement to the poster is also available. The poster notifies employees and applicants that the employer is a federal contractor and advises them of their rights. Another obligation of contracting offices is the referral of complaints. Complaints received by the contracting officer alleging a violation of the requirements of any of the laws that OFCCP enforces should be referred immediately to the OFCCP regional office. The complainant shall be advised in writing of this referral. The contractor that is the subject of the complaint shall not be advised in any manner or for any reason of the complainant's name, the nature of the complaint, or the fact that a complaint was received. Similarly, inquiries from labor unions regarding the revision of a collective bargaining agreement in order to comply with any of the OFCCP laws should be referred to the regional office nearest of the place of performance. The incorporation of the EO clauses, EEO is the law, and the referral of inquiries and complaints apply to all federal contracts and subcontractors. The notification of award for construction contracts and subcontracts in excess of $10,000 is unique to construction contracts. Generally, construction contracts are contracts for the mitigation, remediation, construction, or rehabilitation of a physical structure. So when making such an award, written notice must be given to the appropriate re OFCCP regional office within 10 working days of the award of the contract or subcontract of $10,000 or more subject to affirmative action requirements. This notification of construction award should include name, address, telephone number of the contractor, the employer identification number, the dollar amount of the contract, the contract number, the estimated starting and completion dates, geographical areas in which the work shall be performed. This concludes the formal portion of our training on EEO responsibilities for federal procurement officers. The key takeaways are, as a contracting officer, you play a significant role in ensuring federal contractors are aware of their equal employment opportunity and affirmative action obligations. Your responsibilities are important at the solicitation, pre-award, and award of the contract. It is very important that the EO clause that you are using are up to date and are incorporated into all covered federal contracts and subcontracts. 
Contracting officers must check the pre-award registry and SAM for contracts that meet the threshold. You must also ensure that contractors receive all the support and tools, such as posters and EEO clauses and etc., to ensure their success. OFCCP has resources available for prospective contractors. We certainly appreciate these dedicated professionals who've taken time out of their day to guide us on the EEO responsibilities of federal procurement officers. We certainly hope you found today's seminar beneficial, as we're sure it gives us all a greater appreciation for what we need to be aware of in our procurement actions. Stay tuned as we take a five-minute break. After, we'll return with Brenda Williams-Stewart to answer a few of your questions.
Hello and thank you for returning to the live question and answer session with representatives from the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. We have a number of fantastic questions in search of answers, so let's begin. Uh, Melissa, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll take the first question. If the contractor is new and has never developed an AAP, should we refer them to a local OFCCP office? There are several places that you can refer a new uh, contractor. You can refer them to the OFCCP website where there are FAQs, training webinars, and information for small and new contractors. You can also refer them to a local OFCCP office for further compliance assistance. Okay, another question, just to clarify, for construction contractors, what is the threshold dollar amount contracting officers should look for when giving notice to OFCCP? And the answer is $10,000. That's for construction contractors. The next question, and this is continuing with construction contractors, what does a construction contractor do when the work is taking place at different locations must they have different minority goals for each location? So the, the answer is the minority goals are dependent upon a geographical location. So yes, they vary by geographical location. The goal for females for construction contractors is 6.9%. So before I answer question number four, which is what happens if we find the construction contractor has entered into a subcontract prior to notifying us. I'd like to thank all the procurement officials who are online now for all their hard work. Without your help in submitting pre-award clearances, uh, OCCP would not have the information available for us to continue uh, enforcement of equal opportunity uh, provisions. Uh, and with that, I will answer the question for question number four. Um, so the question assumes that the prime contractor would already have a, in place a subcontract. I think what the question should say is if the construction contractor is about ready to award a subcontract because a lot of the times uh, a contractor will not award a subcontract until it's contingent on the actual award, the actual signing by the contracting officer of the document making award to the prime contractor. When that happens, then there are obligations on the part of the, of the contractor to notify OFCCP of, or I should say notify the contracting officer of who all the subs are. In the, in the context of a, of a construction contract, uh, we may already have that, this information based on, if it's construction, I presume it would be uh, the data that, would, that the contracting officer would have would be the invitation for bid documents, which would identify all the subcontractors. Um, if that's the case, then OSCCP would then reach out and do an analysis of both the, the construction contractors and the, the subcontractors. Um, do you have any additional comments, Melissa, on that point? No. All right, let's go to the next question. Go ahead. Okay, I'll take this one. If a contracting officer does not, for various reasons, meet the 30-day window, can we request an expedited pre-award clearance? We really don't have any processes for expedited pre-award clearances, but um, usually in practice we can clear them pretty quickly within a couple of days to a week. Keep in mind though, if OFCCP decides to do a compliance review, we have an additional 20 days to do that. So that might play into the 30-day window. Next question. Yeah, next question. Uh, can we award the contract on the 16th day if we hear nothing from OFCCP? And yes, you can. We have OFCCP has 15 days to respond after we receive the pre-award request. If OFCCP is silent, then the contracting officer can assume that it has been cleared. Next question. Uh, let's see. So with respect to question number seven, if, if, if I get a call from my subcontractor or employee indicating there's discrimination going on. It's my first step contacting OSCCP or is, is the call from, I'm assuming, the unions. Um, with respect to question number seven, if the contracting officer uh, gets notice of 
of some discrimination going on at the at the contract site, they should contact OSCCP, and I'll turn it over to Melissa to, to give out the details of how to do that and where to do that. Yeah, we had it on slide, I think it was 37. Um, you, the co uh, contracting officer, should give the complainant notice in writing of the referral to OFCCP. Um, the contractor that is subject to the complaint should not be advised in any manner or any reason of the complainant's name or the nature of the complaint. Um, and then for unions, if, if you get notifications or inquiries from unions regarding their uh, bargaining agreements, then you also need to send those to OFCCP. You need to send them to your regional OFCCP office, and that was earlier in the pre presentation, the different slides. We have six regional offices. You can send it to Dallas, San Francisco, Philadelphia, New York, Atlanta, and San Francisco. Next slide. So I think this one's yours, Melissa. What is the information submitted for the notification of construction award does not give the location where work sites will be performed since they are working in multiple sites? We also have another question on this, and it's called the place of performance. So when you're looking for notification or you're, you're doing a pre-award request, either one, you need to send it to the regional office where the place of performance is located. If there are multiple places of performance, that's the one where you can send it to the where the corporate headquarters is located. If you have multiple places of performance, uh, don't be surprised if you get multiple regions responding to your pre-award clearance. So if you have one that's in the Chicago area and one in the Dallas area, both regional offices might respond to that, even though you sent it just to one region. Uh, next slide. Uh, question number nine, can you give me some more information about changes to the VETS 100 database? So starting April, I'm sorry, August 1st of this year, the VETS 100 form will be replaced by the VETS 4212 form. If you go to www.dol.gov and look under the agency of VETS, you'll find the information about how to fill out that form. It's going to be a slightly different from what you're accustomed to but the information is noted there. Next slide. Uh, this is the one I kind of just answered regarding slide 30. Can you give us some scenarios about which regional office should I send the pre-award clearance to? So the pre-award clearance goes to the region where the place of performance is. If you have multiple places of performance, here again you can send it to where the corporate headquarters is located for the contractor. Um, and then again, you might get multiple responses from different regions that received your pre-award request. So with respect to question number 11, with, uh, with respect to inquiries from unions referenced in slide 38, why would the unions be interested in, re in revisions to the collective bargaining in order to comply with OCCP laws? Um, one reason why the unions would be interested in Provisions of the collective bargaining agreement is that they it, they may impact uh, the wages of their of their members, but also uh, it may impact uh, the way they handle seniority, which is a big issue for for unions. Um, that's why would they be reaching out and and asking about uh, who is the new contractor and what are the obligations of the new contractor continue to continue on with the collective bargaining agreement. That's a separate discussion, but I can tell you that. Normally, in the situation where you have an old contractor being replaced by a new contractor, the new contractor would be obligated to follow the collective bargaining agreement of the old contractor until negotiations have occurred and a new CBA is in effect. Uh, next question. Also, I want to add sure. on a collective bargaining agreement, there is an EO clause. And so we've made some changes and updates that we've gone through in the presentation to the EO clause. And so that would also have to be updated in the collective bargaining agreement. Next slide. Question number 12. With respect to FOIA, what would OSCP do if they get a FOIA from a contractor that's interested in information related to the pre-award process? So let me give, a little, give you a little bit of background about that. Um, there are times when, say, uh, the incumbent contractor did not get the follow-on contract. So they know that another contractor is 
uh, is going to be getting this contract, there are situations where the incumbent contractor would then submit a FOIA just to find out who the, uh, the, the awardee is uh, prior to award. As many of the procurement officials know, it would be inappropriate under the FAR regulations for us to release that information. So we would not uh, provide that information as to who the prospective awardee is under FOIA. Uh, we wouldn't give that information until out and to anyone until an uh, award has actually been made, and in which case the contracting officer has an obligation to notify the, the disappointed offerors or, or bidders of who the awardee is. Next slide. I think that one's yours, yeah. Melissa. Yeah. Did you say that there was an updated equal opportunity is included in the law poster that we should be using for contracts? So the EEO, or EEO is the law poster that's also done by OFCCP and EEOC. And yes, there is a supplement on both OFCCP's website and EEOC's website in addition to a printed version of the poster. Next slide. All right, so we have uh, here uh, a couple of questions that we've gotten that aren't in the slides that we've gotten from the public. We can go through those, and then we'll find out if there's some additional information, additional questions being raised by the, by the public. Uh, the first question that we have is, could a given contract already in place, uh, hold on one second, be can uh, already in place end up being canceled because of a debarment issue? So I think in that particular question, um, we would get a pre-award clearance of a contract, and we would be, we would when us and when when we're reviewing that particular question, we would see that, for example, the uh, awardee is, is debarred. So we would refer that information back to the contracting officer. I'm sure that that contractor would also do an independent analysis of that, but that would prohibit uh, the award of the contract. Uh, both um, the procurement officials and OCCP rely on the SAM database for, for us to know whether a particular contractor is debarred. Uh, for those uh, listening in today, debarment not only impacts uh, contractors from the perspective of the FAR, but it also impacts OCCP because we have separate authority that allows us to debar uh, contractors, and we do have a few debarments in place now. The next question that we have are, what are the consequences for not submitting a pre-award clearance or not waiting for a pre-award clearance? Um, well, there are a couple of different scenarios. The, the one that comes to mind right off the top of my head is the situation where there's been no pre-award clearance submitted, an award is made by a contracting officer. Um, there, there can be a situation where, say, for example, the incumbent contractor doesn't get the follow-on contract. In that situation, um, I've, I've known uh, from previous experience that it's not uncommon for the inc incumbent contractor to follow a bid protest. What that means is that the incumbent contractor would sue uh, the government either at the Government Accountability Office or at the Court of Federal Claims alleging improprieties. Uh, a strong legal argument could be made that not following the pre-award clearance would make the government liable. And by that I mean it would make the agency liable to uh, attorney's fees and costs if it's a small business. Uh, and it would also uh, preclude the award of the contract, the, either the Government Accountability Office or the judge at the Court of Federal Claims would, uh, would direct um, the, uh, the uh, government agency to uh, review the award and do an analysis and do another award based on that impropriety. Are there any other questions? Take a look here. No. All right. Well, thank you so much. Don't forget, the Federal Acquisition Institute has recorded today's seminar and a video. Along with the presentation materials saw today, it will be posted in the video library on FAI.gov. You should be able to access these items in a week or so. On behalf of the Federal Acquisition Institute, thank you once again for joining us.